I'm just going to read a short section, about five minutes, from my new novel, The Song That Sings Us. This section comes from the first chapter. Um, uh, and just to give you a little bit of background, Harlan and her younger siblings, Sister Zeno and twin brother Ash, are escaping from the armed automator forces who have attacked their mountain home. The automators have come because they found out that the twins, Zeno and Ash, are in possession of an outlawed power, the power of Siadu, which confers the ability to eavesdrop on the thoughts of other species. Now, the automators see the natural world as something just to be used, exploited, manipulated in any way they like, and they certainly don't want anybody listening in to other voices and opinions of other species. So in this section, the children have been forced to snowboard down a long, dangerous gully very early in the morning with nothing to guide them but moonlight. Um, and it's told here from Harlan's perspective. A wind is getting up, siphoning up the gully from the valley floor, slithering over the powder and whipping it into a low, icy mist, obscuring their snowboards for moments on end. Easily enough time to hit a rock. But they can't slow down. They must keep the impact on the snow light and quick, or risk starting an avalanche. Then the gully turns to the left, out of the wind, but into deep shadow. Harlan's eyes struggle for a moment in the lower light and lose sight of Zeno and Ash. When she spots them again, they're fifty feet behind her, and above them in the air, almost on them, are two dark shapes. Falcons. The birds of prey are huge and very fast. Harlan's never seen falcons so big or willing to fly in moonlight. They're strange and menacing and very clearly tracking the children. But the thing that makes Harlan's blood run suddenly ice cold is that Zeno clearly doesn't know they're there. Zeno's power of tuning into bird minds is exceptional. She can sense the presence of a bird that she can neither hear nor see, tune in to a passing goldfinch a hundred feet up in the air. Yet she hasn't sensed this creature, and it's almost on her shoulder. Just as the wrongness of, of this hits Harlan in the belly, the birds stoop, full of malevolent intent. Their dark bodies dive like missiles, wings part-folded like the fletches of giant arrows. The air is fractured by their speed as a flash of yellow eyes and outstretched talons, more like steel daggers. Harlan screams a warning and now, at last, Zeno and Ash see them too. Zeno lets out a high-pitched cry of shock. She ducks and one falcon skims her head and wheels around for another pass. Ash hasn't been so lucky. The other bird has raked him with a claw and there's a dark line of blood across his cheek. Trees, Harlan yells. Into the trees. Ash and Zeno understand at once. Close-packed trees clothe this section of the slope to the left of the gully. To board between them at this speed in moonlight is insane. But it's the only way to lose the birds. Falcons are built for high speed in open country, not for fast changes of direction in the enclosed space of a dense woodland. Moonlight, deep shadow tree trunks come at the speeding borders in a high-velocity tangle. Every microsecond could smash any of them into a tree. Harlan hears the gasps of effort, the scrape and swish of boards, turning at the last possible moment as her brother and sister make split-second decisions about which way to turn and how. She sees them disappear and appear between the trees, in shadow, in light, in shadow again, close then far, close again, as if time was being cut into unconnected chunks. Everything seems to get faster and faster, more disjointed, senses, muscles, joints are close to overload, and still the birds pursue them. Look out! Ash yells a warning. One falcon is coming straight for the side of Harlan's face, but the bird is so focused on its target, it looks only where its feet will strike. Harlan jinks sideways and scrapes the tree trunk with the edge of her board. The falcon's left wing smashes into the trunk. There's a snap, loud as a rifle, as the bird shatters into a floundering mess of feathers. Ash and Zeno crow with delight. 
and then Zeno screams. Harlan sees her shoot past, flashing between the trees, with the foot of the other falcon tangled in her hood. Zeno swats at it in panic with her hand, trying to keep her balance on the slope, then rips the hood away and swirls it. Too late, the falcon realises its mistake. Zeno smashes it into a passing tree and its head explodes. By then, the children are a hundred feet further on, speeding ever faster through the trees. Like the birds, too focused on what's just in front of them to see the bigger picture. By the time Harlan registers the end of the trees, they're all in the air. They've shot out over the lip where the slope of trees became sheer rock face and are now falling. Harlan is aware of the quiet once again as their fall seems to go on and on. She has time to see the moon setting behind the mountains, the stars, the shapes of her brother and sister against the indigo sky, against the dull pearl of the snow. Oh, she thinks, we're going to die. And then they drop into snow on the slope below the rock face. Harlan thinks of Ma dropping berries into whipped cream one summer day, counting as they made a satisfying plop. One, two, three. They are blackberries dropped in cream, side by side, alive, unbroken, up to their waist in the fluffiest powder they've ever seen. It seems impossible, insane, wonderful. They fight to get legs and boards free. Harlan manages first. She stands to get her breath, the relief of survival running through her. Then there's a sound. A low crack. Zeno, Ash and Harlan all know the sound of that crack. It's the most frightening sound they know. It means avalanche. A black rupture appears in the pale face of the slope, running from Harlan to Zeno, from Zeno to Ash, like a jagged pointing finger. Some invisible tension has snapped. Their luck has run out. In the early light of a just-born day, Ash's face is too distant for Harlan to see. But she can see Zeno, though she's not close enough to grab, to touch, to hold and never let go. Close enough to see Zeno's eyes fill with fear. Close enough to hear her, for the first time in a long time, say, Harlan! Harlan! The snow below gives way, as if it had just evaporated. They fall into a pounding maelstrom of white. Mm -hmm.